Bonjour et bienvenue à notre webinaire. Good day and welcome to this webinar. I'm taking good decisions. What should I do individually and in groups hosted by the Jesuits of Canada? We're delighted to have Sister Laurence Lublière as our guest speaker. Thank you for being here with us today. Before beginning, I'd like to provide a few instructions for those who prefer to listen in English. I'm about to give you some instructions. So if you're on a computer in your webinar controls, click on the interpretation button. And that would be either at the top or the bottom of the screen, depending on your device. And cl click on the language you'd like to hear. You click and you'll see the options, French and English. If you're on a mobile device, in your meeting controls, press the button with the little the three little dots or more, and then tap the language, uh, the, the language interpretation button. After that, you can choose a language you'd like to hear. It's important to remember that uh, the language interpretation button is not available uh, when accessing Zoom on a web browser. So uh, keep that in mind. And now we'll move to uh, our land acknowledgement. Uh, so we're going to begin by acknowledging the indigenous people on all the lands that we find ourselves on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, let us take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which so many of us call home. And we do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. In Canada, from coast to coast, we recognize and acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, the Métis, and the First Nations people that call this land home. We acknowledge also the harms and the mistakes of the past that we've committed, each one in our own way, and we commit ourselves to move towards the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. There's also a few things that you need to know before starting. The session today will last 20, 90 minutes approximately. This will include the presentation and also time to answer questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&R box, in the, ch the chat, or the Q&R box, I should say, on the bottom of your screen normally. If not, the, the, the go into the chat and the chat may not be done. So please put it in the Q&R box, I'm sorry, not the chat box, the Q&R box. And finally, we're recording this session, which will be sent to registered participants within the 72 next hours. So there will be a recording and you'll receive it in three days. So to start, our guest speaker for today for is a Sister Laurence Lubière, Xavier's sister and director of the Service of Discernment in Common for the Jesuits in Canada with a background in management, consulting, Ignatian spirituality. Sister Lubière assists with decision-making and strategic planning processes. She has more than 15 years of experience in sustainable and responsible investing. We thank her for being with us. Thank you and hello to all. I'm very happy to be working with you today for this session on the taking, just making good decisions. So we're gonna start the presentation right now with the screen. The text that you might have had will allow us to be receive a presentation. And then I'm gonna ask you to take a little bit of time to reflect to what touched you in this presentation, what you retained from this presentation, and then we'll have questions and answers, Q&A at the end. So we sharing on things that struck you most. So there you have it. So what should I do? How do I take make good decisions individually and in group? So first of all, if you clarifications to present who I am. I'm, as Jose said, I'm director for common discernment for the Jesuit province in Canada. It's a service whose purpose is to help 
the religious communities and the Jesuit apostolates, but also other religious communities and organizations in their communal discernment processes and for planning, training and plan, planning. So it's an advisory group and a, a, a group that assists people in discernment process. We give trainings, workshops, and facilitation for common discernment. So what should I do? It's a question that comes back often in our lives. I'm sure it's a question that you're used to. What should I do? What can I do? And our life is really a succession of decisions, of choices that we need to take. It could be small choices, daily choices, life uh, you know, to eat, at what time we're going to eat, what we, what, when, we're, when we're going to work, how are we starting our day off, and could also be major choices on our fundamental orientation, our vocation, our choice of professional life, our commitments in life, marriage or religious life, for example. So we're challenged by all kinds of choices, small and great. And so it's really important to learn to make good choices, to take good decisions. And finally, to develop this capacity of making good decisions, a way of living well and in all these small and larger decisions. So taking, making good decisions is a school of life that lasts a lifetime. So it's important to learn to live this out carefully. And the Ignatian spirituality provides and can provide some answers uh, on, on this process. We're going to, in this presentation, we're going to look at different things. First of all, we're going to look at Ignatius Loyola's itinerary because Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuits, had experience in his own life a lot of things uh, concerning decision making and this was that is what is part of this inspired uh, uh, the whole ignatian spirituality uh, so it'll be interesting to come back on his his itinerary to, to see how he made his decisions and then we'll in a, we'll look at look at certain elements of the ignatian spirituality foundations in this process. Then third, here they will look at some personal discernment tools that are important for personal discernment, tools to uh, help in communal discernment because we are sometimes in groups, and finally questions and answers that we will talk about later on. So first of all, Ignatius Loyola's itinerary. Ignatius came from a noble family in the Basque County country, he was he was going, wanted to be a military career. He was trained for this to serve the King of Spain, and so committed himself to the army. And had, had an important career in the military life to really be a noble, a successful noble. And, and, be, and being present in the, to the King of Spain. But he found himself, this project was completely thwarted uh, because he found himself wounded in a battle. So in Pungton, he was wounded. And during, there's a cannonball that, that broke his leg and he found himself on, on the side lines convalescing and this military project was completely thwarted because it was impossible for him to con con compete, continue in his career. During his convalescence, he, he was in the, the Loyola ca castle to recuperate from this wound uh, and try to put it stay straight again. And during this convalescence, he was took care of his affairs, and he called to a, a radically different life. In his heart, there was a emotions in view of the things that he was thinking about. So he was reflecting on a lot of things, like 
uh, undertake a career somewhere else, find a nobility again, doing working for a, a lady uh, or whatever, uh, the, the noble clan. And so he had all kinds of uh, possibilities, but he found out that his energy and his enthusiasm was not working out. So he, he had a choice for life for Christ because he, he read some books and the books that we gave him at, were the life of Christ, the imitation of Christ. And so he started thinking about this, about following Christ and seeing how he could imitate St. Dominic, Dominic or St. Francis and follow Christ in that way. So a type of poverty, radical poverty. And he also, he has he had a lot of joy and enthusiasm and that enthusiasm was sustained in the, during his convalescence. And so he was put, placed open to God. And then he started spiritual reality. He saw that this whole thing came from God. So he started to follow this pathway and saw that the Lord was inviting him to follow him with a radical following without knowing exactly where it would lead because this fundamental discovery was informed his spirituality because he understood there that there was a way of recognizing and choose that came from the Lord in respect to other thoughts that were linked up to the world. And so by following this intuition, what he felt at that time, he, he set out and started working almost as a walking out as a pilgrim and trying to choose to see what he what he can and what the Lord was t inviting him to to do take to take the so he set out in, in 1522 started walking a lot through Europe the Lord invited him he was one day to Jerusalem there where the Christ lived but he he went to Jerusalem someday but but he couldn't go into first because of for security reasons so he found himself in Europe and asking himself, what should I do? What must I do? And then he, uh, he asked himself, what would be the fundamental life orientation? And in prayer, he really received this orientation, this desire of helping people, helping souls, helping people to turn towards God and to help them to find the road of the pathway of God and to adventure out on that uh, roadway. And so he saw that to help people in the context where he experienced in order to be credible, to have the possibility to help other beings, he saw that he had to train himself and obtain a diploma that would give him that capacity and recognition of being to help, help others. So he went back to school following this intuition of helping souls he went to school back again and with even young children. He was 30 years old, of age. He sat down on, on these school benches so as to learn. So it, then afterwards, the theology. He went to Paris to do theology, where he met the company, the companions. In England, the uh, into Holland, and she went to see how to help people preaching a retreat, uh, doing the first spiritual exercises to, so that they can find God in their lives, in their daily lives. And from one end to the, one event to the next, he he set up with his first companions, the Society of Jesus, the Congregation of Jesuits, and they were in the service of the Pope. And then in 1540, the Pope of the time uh, accepted the creation of the congregation. 
So all the life of Ignatius, he was unified around this fundamental call that he recognized within himself to help souls. And all the events of his life, all his decisions were taken in a way of being faithful to the call of saving souls and to incarnate that call in flesh and that in flesh that call. So the statutes of the company of the Society of Jesus, the purpose of the society is really to help the souls of its members and of their neighbors to attain the final end for which they were created. So they were created by God for God. So the particular gift of Ignatius was to become an instrument of God's grace, partaking in Christ's mission, completely given over to the Spirit by embodying ever more fully the grace that God has placed in him for the good of all and to help out souls. His whole life was, was, uh, was an offering of a vision and tools drawn from personal experience to help people to help souls to find themselves their own fundamental call and to acquire a method of decision making to live out this call in a concrete way to see how god calls us each one of us to our to uh, our to our final state and to use with their personal experiences by looking at one's own experience, then they can decide how to go forth. So Ignatius developed the spiritual exercises, which is a, a 30-day 30, 30 retreat, which lasts four weeks, four weeks, to help people to receive and choose their fundamental call and then to orient and ordain and order one's life accordingly, because this was a process that allows the reti re those retreatants to become who they are, uh, uh, to grow in their own identity. And in it, 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 this identity uh, says we do desire and choose what helps us to be faithful to this deep call and also to move away from that which is that which moves us uh, from that which hinders and so now that we've seen his itinerary the, the, now we to show you how the this itinerary uh, touched or influences the ignatian spiritualities spirituality This is a condensed form based on Ignatian's experience, and we're part of the Ignatian spirituality, and it helps us in the choices that we take on a daily basis. So, first of all, within the Christian life, Christian life is really a life received by God, created for God. We are created by God to praise God, to serve God with all our being, with all our heart and all our souls, and accomplish our life, fulfill our lives found in this response, this call. This carries fruits. So it's in this understanding that we, uh, our life comes from God and finds its fulfillment in God. Our life has a meaning, a purpose. We each have a deep calling that allows us to take our place in creation. Uh, take our place in creation, so to be able to be fruitful and to fulfill that. So discover and live out the special grace the fundamental call that God has placed us in for the good of all. As St. Paul says in the letter to Corinthians, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit, and there are a variety of services, but it's the same Lord. There are, are a variety of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them in everyone. And to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So each person receives a grace 
a particular vocation, a deep call, which is really geared so that we can fulfill our call and shared with others. And it's this way that the body of Christ is built with what each can offer in terms of the gift that he or she has received. Another element, a fundamental element of these Ignatian spiritualities is the conviction that God works in the shadows. God is present at work everywhere in all creatures, in all peoples, in all circumstances, and in all events. The Spirit constantly calls us forth and align our desiring, aligning our desires and decisions with the directions indicated by the Spirit. And the Spirit invites us always to turn toward God, to serve God, to accomplish what God wants for us, which is goodness in fulfillment, becoming who we are and who we are in truth. So if God works and if the Spirit calls us always, it's really important to be able to recognize the Spirit in our lives to align our own desires and our decisions on the direction given to us by the Spirit of the Lord. So it's not a question of solving problems, but we need to open ourselves up and be in, touched by the Spirit who will show us the decision that would be good for us and the decision that God wants for us. In that way, we really become collaborators with God because we're working with God who was already working in this world and we participate in God's mission, the mission of Christ to reconcile all things in God. In doing this, we become who we are and we can be, bear fruit that way the fruit for the good of all. So in this perspective, taking decisions becomes a seeking of consistency, striving for consistency because we put place ourselves, we get in tuned to God's desire for us, the desire that God has for us indicated by the Spirit. So we try to find out to the Spirit, until the road that the Spirit inv invites us to. So deciding becomes a search for coherence in who I am, the who, uh, and the, the deep vocation that God calls us to, what I do, in other words, what I'm, how, how, and the way I, how, how I do it. With those three questions, we encounter the, the, the presence of God in our life, and this way we show that this life is something of God that God gave us. And Christ is the one who lives out this coherence perfectly. The Son of God sent by God and is God's, Jesus' whole life to, uh, witnessed uh, that everything he is and does, it, does it was always in concordance with fulfilling the call of God in his life. So, so he, Jesus has, re, has revealed this to us so we can become aware of our own identity as child of God. So, 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 so the, Jesus' life is being are the word of God. And to know Christ inwardly allows us to imitate and resemble him. And so that our life witnesses really who Jesus is. We have uh, one of the important things for Ignatian, Ignatius is to know inwardly Christ. And we use the spiritual exercises as a, which, as a way of praying and see uh, the, the, you know, the Christ in the Gospels and discover Christ so that we can model ourselves on Christ and, and, and fall, be able to follow Jesus better. What Ignatius also f discovered in his first experience when he was in bed, the Spirit is within us and calls us in the proper direction. But unfortunately, there's also not only the Spirit of God that brings us closer to God, but the Spirit of evil that turns us away from God and from ourselves and locks us 
in the lie. So it's really important to recognize and distinguish which are the spirits, the spirit of God or the spirit of the evil one. And so, because then we could go in one direction or the other. So we need to know how to accept and refuse the orientations of the, of the good spirit and refuse the, the spirit of evil that seeks to keep us away from God's real call of the proper uh, path that we are to follow. And so Ignatius proposes a certain number of rules to discern the action of the spirit in us and to see if we are free and how we can re refuse the spirit of evil. So it's something that's very important in the Ignatian spirituality. We may coordinate the act these activities of the spirit. We see what's happening in us. Here is the what we call consolation, which is the role of the spirit. We're in a state of dynamism and gratitude to our hope that lasts our faith in God, our, our, our love for, the, for our neighbor. So these are signs that the spirit animates us and that we are walking truly in the direction that the spirit gives us. It could be, well, all about being in consolation, we could have moments of suffering in the same way that when we pray with Christ and Christ's passion, we see as the suffering of Christ because it's a good thing to be accepted uh, because of uh, being able to pray even because of sin or evil. It places us with God, with the Christ, in this refusal of the sin and of the evil, of the violence and the hatred that we have in this life. So the consolation is a sign of alignment and consistency with the Spirit's invitation and a sign that we're on the right track. On the opposite side is desolation, which expresses itself by some kind of decreased dynamism, a type of dis discouragement with doubts, inner darkness. We withdraw on ourselves. We have the feeling of being separated from God not having uh, any taste for anything for, of God. So it's important to see these moments because they show that we're not uh, no longer alignment. We're on a pathway that is uh, taking us away from God. And this can be when we're in a situation of sin, when we clearly refuse God. It can also be a time to test our resolutions to show us who God is and become aware that we need to be firm in our decisions and in our way of situating ourselves. And we also see that we depend on God. It's not up to us. We can't give ourselves consolations in permanence. In permanency, we have to become aware that, that the yes that we take and took with God depends on God. We're not sufficient in ourselves. We need to be with the, the all-powerful and to live with this God on the pathway. A few tools for discernment. You probably understood since the beginning of this presentation that the decision-making process in Ignatian spirituality will be making choices according to the deep call that animates us, according to what is really deep and true for us and that we really want to, to live. So the decision has a different dimension when it is part of that journey of, uh, of that movement. When we choose, we'll be able to embed in the concrete dimension of our life, the expression of that deep call in us, inviting us to take action, but in a certain way. So we'll try to choose what helps us to grow, what um, compels us to embody 
that call. And we will also turn away from what prevents us going in that direction. So that's why it is important to do that first work of identification or constant work of distinction, sorting, that we call discernment. Discernment is not, is not something that we do every now and then, uh, just when we have to make uh, big decisions, but it's really a way of being permanently, to be attentive to what's going on in us so that we can perceive how the spirit is inviting us to, um, to, to, to move. Now the tools, <clears throat> the tools for discernment are several. First of all, the prayer, the spiritual direction, the reviewing of events. Then we look at a scale of value that is also interesting as a tool for making decisions and um, the choosing between two options. First of all, the prayer. The prayer is really at the heart of the discernment, being attentive to um, the way God is guiding us. It's really the spirit that teaches us all things. So there can't be any discernment without prayer. If we do not take that time to pray and be really rooted in the prayer, we won't be able to discern. And Ignatius in his uh, spiritual exercises during the uh, 30 days, each exercise that the participants have to do has to begin with the prayer, always the same prayer. And it's that request, may all my intentions, actions, operation be purely directed to the praise and service of God. So it's important to have consistency between intentions, actions, operations, so that everything is aligned. Everything is tuned to this action of the spirit in me, because this is what will guide me in that direction that is the praise and service of God. And he asks to contemplate Christ in the Gospels. He's inviting us at the end of each day to pray the examen prayer to see what was the source of consolation, what was the source of desolation during the day. And so that the next day will be better at choosing what is the good for us and uh, letting go what is uh, bad or evil. He's also inviting us to offer what we are to, so that we open um, by so offering all our gifts that God gave to us, that's what we call the prayer of offering. So it might be also important to consider the experience of a retreat to help in the discernment over a day, a couple of days, a weekend, or even in some circumstances, uh, taking a, a longer retreat, a 30 days retreat which is um, a very fundamental stone in, in a lifetime. Another important dimension for the decision-making process is the spiritual accompaniment. As the discernment is nourished by prayer, it might be interesting to meet on a regular basis a person who is uh, properly formed in a spiritual uh, direction and share with that person what you have heard or felt uh, from the Lord. It will help you to put words in that experience. And uh, it will also give you the chance to, uh, to receive a feedback to also understand what the other person hears or understand in what we're seeing. And it also help you to grow in freedom so receiving an echo and encouragement is important and all that spiritual direction peace is very important another another step is the reviewing of an event or a period of time and it means going back to when it happened and try to find in what we are feeling try to find to understand how god 
was at work in us, was working in us and how the, the spirit of evil also sometimes tries to hamper our, our process. So the reviewing is calling upon our memory, of course, but also listening attentively to understand how the spirit is at work and how the spirit of God is inviting us to, to progress, to go ahead. So it's an important exercise for practicing our freedom because everything happens in, in very concrete aspects of our life, in, in experiences, situations, small and bigger. So God is already, is always speaking to us. So it's important to analyze all those dimensions of our life in order to, to be able to choose the, the pathway of God. Another tool that I find quite useful personally, and uh, I've heard from other persons that it's, it's quite interesting, to help you uh, understand how the, uh, the Lord is guiding you. So you might you choose an, an event, whether it was uh, last week, or last month, and uh, try to understand what is the event, the thing that happened that is a source of uh, joy, of consolation. It could be also a moment that you're grateful for, and it's a source of consolation. That's on one end. And then you try to retrieve an event that was uh, painful, maybe, or um, not so grateful. And then even a moment that was extremely discouraging, uh, that, was, uh, that involved a lot of energy from, from you and was uh, the least grateful. So try to focus on those events and describe them. So you make, first of all, in the first column, you make a, a factual description. Uh, you give a factual description of the event. Then the next column, you try to surface what feelings it triggered. What do I feel? What happens to me? So describing the emotions that you feel it could be joy, it could be hope, it could be pride, it could be on the consolation side, and on the more difficult side, it could be discouragement, anger. Um, it's important to surface also the, the negative feelings. Then next, try to understand why. Why you feel particularly good or happy and why that thing makes me uh, discouraged or why do I experience such a hard time when I'm living that uh, situation. Then it's also important to ask myself, is that true? What I'm understanding of me is true or not? Because sometimes we have an interpretation of an event that is not, is not true, is not exact. If during a meeting there's uh, an exchange with a person and something goes, uh, goes wrong, and my interpretation after is, it's because this person doesn't like me. Now, maybe that's wrong. Maybe that person at that moment, that precise moment was simply uh, angry, but not necessarily uh, to you. So when you interpret the situation like being that person is um, is angry about me, it's wrong. So confronting your interpretation with elements that might validate or not your interpretation, just to make sure that you are, that your perception is right or not. Then the decision and action step. So if I believe my interpretation is right and uh, looking back to the different steps, it's important to try to find a certain form of freedom in order to be able to choose what will be helpful to me to, to go ahead, to progress in uh, that avenue that I'm invited to, to, to follow. So another tool 
that might be useful is this scale of values to understand, to position, to situate the questions. So, and also to help me realign, to help me um, be more consistent. So, according to what I find or what I um, retrieve in that scale of values, I may carry on in the same direction or decide to make adjustment changes to, um, to, to, to progress better. So this is how the scale is structured. You have different levels. That's a scale uh, that was developed by Bernard Lonargan, who's a philosopher, theologian, who was a Canadian uh, theologist, uh, um, Canadian uh, Jesuit, he, he died in 84, and he developed this scale of values that shows how in human life, there are different levels of values and they're interconnected, but distinct. And they are structured in such a way that they give a consistency in our life. So first of all, you have the, the, the vital level, the fundamental one about health, uh, food, sleep, so vital needs to be fulfilled. Then the social level, and that's a level where we interact with other persons, like uh, work, studies, relations, the communities that we are a member of, relationships with friends, the organizations around us, the, the clubs, parishes, all our social life, our life in society happens at this second level, the social level. Then there's the cultural level. And it's about the values that define the way that we are doing things socially. Because depending on the culture, we'll be doing things differently. Depending on the countries or the cultures, we will give uh, attribute different values to different things, and there will be the reflection of local culture. Often, I take the example of the, the meal. The relationship with the meal might differ from one country to another. In Spain, for example, uh, supper is very late at night. It's around 10 o'clock p.m., while in Canada, we have supper around 5, 6 o'clock. In France, it's around 8 o'clock at night. So depending on the different schedules, in Canada often, at lunchtime, in Canada people eat quickly, something fast, and often they bring their own lunch bag and they, they eat in 10 minutes maybe, while in France, often, the people stop working, they take uh, an hour to go for lunch together, to uh, have the time to, for conversations, and then go back to work. So just to give you an example uh, of different ways of doing things, there's no good or bad. It's just that in Canada, we prefer living our day in a more efficient way and try to be focused on, on work and we finish earlier. While in France, it's really important to take time for lunch, to spend time to meet with people because there are important things that happen also during those uh, those moments, those lunches. So it's it's a way of doing things that is different, that is good for, for the, that culture. So then there's the personal level. It's about choices and decisions. And then the religious level with uh, all the graces received in prayer. What is interesting with that scale of values is that we can see how our gravity center, our Christian identity, is located here between the religious and personal level. So we really uh, children of God. We receive our faith from God, but also God has created us free to um, to live our life. So then our gravity center may move. Then we're called to make a certain number of choices that will ask us to choose some values that will translate into ways of doing things. And this will have an impact on the way we live, we uh, we eat, we sleep. So 
you see with that scale of values you see how we can embody very concretely a spiritual identity through our choices through our cultural values that we embrace and then uh, through the the way we live our social relationships and also through the way that we take care of our health our food our sleep what is interesting is that we realize that when there's something that is not aligned for example if we don't sleep enough if during our life we realize that we need more sleep because we're very tired we'll have to change something also at the social level in the way we organize our time so we can address an issue at one level but we need to make changes at other levels at a higher level in that scale of values if i realize that my, my work is uh, absorbing all my life and i have no more time for family or, or friends culturally i'll have to review or reorganize my values or the the, the ones i'm focused on and understand that there's also value about uh, having uh, uh, relationship with other persons and feed them, cultivate them. And all that can be lived um, as a consequence of choices that are made, choices to live differently. And what is also interesting is to, uh, to see what are the actions on the opposite dimension that will try always to pull us to the towards the bottom so it's important to preserve our freedom in order to uh, discern and the, the spirit the, the evil spirit will always try to make us believe that the most important thing for us can be found in those uh, lower levels so to speak so in the social relations and in the the, the vital level <laughs> so that our gravity center goes down to those uh, two levels for example the evil spirit will invite us to see for example if others have more than what we possess or it will invite us to a form of jealousy uh, such person has more prestige more money more recognition or power so the evil spirit will always invite us to uh, accumulate, for example, honors, things, or social acknowledgement, telling us, well, if you don't have that, you don't exist. While uh, the spirit of Christ is always inviting us to go back to a place of, of poverty, but it's a space of freedom that allows us to choose in life, in um, a journey focused on personal freedom and also another tool is the choosing between two options so listing the advantages or benefits and uh, the drawbacks so if if i do that or if i don't do that making a list of the advantages if we do that thing and also make a list of the drawbacks, then listing the benefits in not doing such things and the drawbacks in, in not doing such things. So once you, you've uh, surfaced all those elements, you focus on uh, that desire to serve the Lord and to offer your life at his service and ask the spirit to understand what are the elements that weight the more, that weigh the more. It's not necessarily an accumulation of uh, in the list in terms of number. It's really understanding what are more important because the spirit is uh, eventually will show us what is the direction that will bring more fruits basically. So now we've looked at all those tools for personal discernment. The question is how to discern as a group, 
how to discern together. And we are using the same principles that each community has. Uh, each group, each religious community has a reason for being, a purpose. So it's its deepest calling. That's what we call the charism when it's a religious community. But for a group, it could be really the objective or the purpose of an association, the purpose of a, a gathering, a group that is embedded in the statutes of the, the organization or the mission statement. The same way, the vocation of the group will be to embody that special call, that special grace or that special project that the, the Lord has entrusted to the group. And uh, the spirit is at work among the members of the group and in all circumstances. So the communal discernment will use tools and processes that will create such conditions that will allow the members to open up to the action of the spirit. Therefore, being able to make decisions uh, moved by uh, the presence of the spirit. So we create the conditions in the group so that the group in a prayer and conversation among the members of the group in a, a specific way of talking to one another and discerning together so that the group may take decisions that will be guided by the spirit. And the decisions are always placed in the perspective of uh, living more, more deeply the fundamental call. So in a group, what we try to do through communal discernment is exactly like the individual. So uh, aligning who we are, what we are called to do, and how we will do it. So we try to align, to align together the who, the what, and the how. And so the group, to make sure that he's on the right track, has to review those questions and ask again those questions. What gives us the most energy or love or zeal? And also look at what is depleting our energy, what is turning us towards ourselves, what are the places of desolation, in order to choose what will be helpful to go forward and uh, to move away from everything that is hindering us. So developing that capacity to uh, review the events so that then we are in such position that we can um, be guided by the Spirit of the Lord. <clears throat> in the communal discernment, we often use the spiritual conversation. It's a tool that allows us to listen personally and communally, to listen to see how the spirit is at work in the group and is inviting us to go forth. And it's a process that is aiming at listening, really listening how the spirit is guiding us. So there's a first tour, uh, first round, where uh, we're praying all together on the same uh, issue. There's a request of grace. So in the first round, each one will share the fruit that we've received in the prayer, the fruits of the personal prayer. Then there's a second round where we <clears throat> say what touched us the most in the first round. And then the third round, what seems to be emerging from the second round. And that allows the group to move from the I, the personal prayer, to the us from me to the we, to really uh, reap the fruit of the conversation. So when we organize a communal discernment, we have times for personal prayer, spiritual conversation in small groups or large groups to help the participant understand how the spirit is inviting them to, to, go, to go forth together. So this, foster a certain number of values that are carried by the, the group itself. First of all, there's a dimension of justice. 
because in those contexts of conversation, each participant has the same uh, time uh, to speak. So out of really a concern of, of justice, everybody has the same amount of time for sharing. It promotes also a dimension of inclusion because in the spiritual conversation, each voice counts because the spirit is speaking through all the persons. And it uh, fosters also promotes responsibility because it's about the commitment to speak one's truth. It um, fosters reconciliation as well because we're not sharing on behalf of uh, an ideology or sensitivity of a church or uh, in a group that might be uh, factions or divisions. So it's important to talk uh, from person to person of what we have received in the prayer, because this allows the persons to, uh, to reach out to one another. So leaving aside any ideology and it promotes also communion because it's not about imposing any view or defending a personal agenda. So in the communal conversation, we are <clears throat> turned together towards God. So we don't want to push our own ideas, but we are trying to see how God is attracting all of us to him. And it also fosters trust trust in God and in one another. So it is important because we understand that we are all part, um, all part of that same adventure. So an important tool, the spiritual conversation, because it, it's really not only guiding the group, but it helps the members live very good experiences. And besides, we also use some navigation tools. If the group is, in, uh, is experiencing consolation or group is ex experiencing desolation, because it will guide the, the group to understand whether it's getting, uh, is getting moved away from the Lord or getting closer. So there are some markers. Like, for example, when we see that each participant is really committed into an active listening and an active speaking, intentional speaking out. And also when we see as the conversation goes along, we see that there's um, a consensus that is surfacing and it gives a lot of uh, energy to the participants. Or when we see the communion growing within the group, we see that there's more appreciation among the members of the group. Or the group might experience moments of desolation sometimes, and it's normal. It's just important to point that out, to, to understand it in order to react. So it's the opposite of consolation. You may see members of the group that are withdrawing, that are stopping participating, or they're drifting away, they, they're not attentive, or they try to impose their personal agenda, or there's a form of competition that is happening or persons who are avoiding to speak and are kind of avoiding the speaking out. So those are all signs of group desolation. So for the, the, the animator, it's important to uh, refocus the group, to help the group getting back in a place where it would be able to, to go ahead. So you see how after this presentation, we see that making decisions and uh, making choices is guided by a deep desire to serve God and give our best. And this will guide all our decisions. And we need to choose what will be helpful to help us, what is uh, dwelling in us. And in the light of that perspective, it makes things much more Interesting. For the discernment, we really have to be there in a serious way and gathering certain elements, or it will be helpful. Do we need to research the options 
and to seeing the advantages, the inconveniences and whatever. And we need some, we have to looking at the options and to work and commit ourselves to prayer and listening. But once more, as I was saying, finally, in this decision is less to solve problems that to allow ourselves to be led by the spirit who accompanies, which accompanies us always uh, to orient us in the right direction and toward the carrier of, uh, of fruit and with be more people would be happier this way. So there you have it. So those are my data. My, if anybody receives the, the electronically this presentation, you can contact me if you wish with the ad, uh, physical address or my email. Now at the same, we're gonna take five minutes a personal reflection time to if this is a lot of information I gave you, but I want you to see what touched me the most in what I just heard and what is for me the main takeaway. So five minutes of silence. A reminder at this at, at the end of this time, you can put your comments in the chat box if you wish. Is that what you would like to do, Laurence? Yeah, if you have any comments or make, put them in the chat box. Anything you want to share, please, the things that touched you. This is for you, eh? it's not general. So you want to just start? So thank you, Laurence, for the session. I'd like to remind you that we'll be sending you the recording of this in the next three days, and you'll have the slides as everything uh, that was shared in this session. And as Sister Laurence said, we're going to receive your questions if you have any. And don't forget that you can continue. You, in the, you can ask questions in the Q&A box. So receive all questions. The first question for those who have worries, major worries, is it important they be healed? For example, mental or physical, could should they be healed before they take on the questions? Because maybe the quality of discernment will be very affected by the, the fear that they had. So what do you think of that? Well, I think that we don't need to be and to be healed to undertake to try and see in the Ignatian discernment what touches us. It's what is important here is to be accompanied if necessary, but maybe somebody spiritually accompany us, somebody with whom we can talk in prayer. And also, if there are excessive things, don't hesitate to be accompanied psychologically, to talk to somebody who is a professional and who can help us uh, uh, put words into what we're experiencing. So get help spiritual with the accompany, spiritual accompaniment, and also a psychological accompaniment. And with these two dimensions, they are in, you, you see how important it is to work together and they will enrich each other mutually. So then, but you don't have to be healed completely to undertake a, a spiritual conversion or a conversation. 
what tools would be used to help groups that are in, in a time of desolation. Well, what could be very helpful for a group is to come back to reorient ourselves on who we are, to concentrate on what we're seeking to accomplish, what we want to live out together, because that's the source of energy that we need. So when the group is able to see really what they're looking for together and to pick up that line of thought, it, it that really, they, it, it take time of silence, a prayer to see what they're seeking. That is very useful then. Thank you, Laurence. How could we reread uh, our, during our time of prayer? What should we note down? Well, in prayer, if you felt that uh, something that came from the Lord or where you received a type of joy or you understood something, something was lightened, is clearer for you, a passage of the scripture or a word in the scriptures that really you, made you vibrate. Because it, it has, you have to touch that, what, that would give you a, a, a zing or a desire for life. Screen is frozen, unfortunately. Laurence is not able to talk anymore. Laurence, we lost your, what you just said. Could you repeat, please? No, come back where we, we started in our prayer, where we feel that God is showing us something and God is showing us through that moment and function what we need to consider. Thank you. A question is for group discernment. In the groups that are not used to the discernment, the sermon, how can the facilitator help the participants who talk too long? Oh, well, that's that explain the rules of the game. So if we facilitate a group, uh, we all tell the group that each one will have the same time to speak. And that way, say, okay, you are finished your, your speech. So when you're at the end of the talk, use a little sign so that you can feel that you need to conclude. And that's part of the rules of the game. The role of the facilitator is to, is to make sure that uh, each one gets the same time. Otherwise, the people they don't respect the games, the rules of the game. We can't uh, accept the process anymore. So we really have to do what we said we were going to do in such a way that people can feel in, in confidence that this is something that we'll be able to participate in. So this discernment, is it important for the facilitator to be outside of the group? Yeah, that can help, she says. It's a discernment that commits the life of the group. But it could be delicate if the resource person who is responsible for the group facilitates. There could be a certain conflict of uh, orientation. So it might be useful to call in somebody from the outside to help everybody have the same uh, distance with the questions and not uh, impact uh, with, with the presence of certain persons in the decision-making. In respect to desolation, is it possible to have des desolation during a spiritual accompaniment? Answer, yes, of course. There's all kinds of things that can happen. Desolation touches us, can be there anytime. We can, we can even in a spiritual accompaniment, even if, uh, one day the accompanier is not listening well, distracted, or what else? That could be time of desolation. And once we see, we talk about it later, and we name it, then we, we can, uh, it allows us to, to, to change or to be clear about it. But each time, 
there's a signal of something, then we need to do something about that. If, it's, if you hear the signal, you see the signal, it's important to do something about it. A group might be linked to the uh, personal accompaniment. People who participate in the group discernment have to enter, enter into conversation, uh, the discernment conversation with a particular attitude. So, what do you advise the group that's starting spiritual conversation with the person with the appropriate position, standards, understanding? Well, before we start, everybody has to understand what's going on, that there is a time of prayer and reflection and prepare something even for the spiritual conversation. In that way, we're really when we arrive there, we're ready to sh we are sharing something that we that the uh, spirit might have given us during prayer, but with some also before uh, in prayer. When when we share together the fruit of uh, prayer and not saying, "Okay, we're this is what I want to get across at this particular time." The fruit of the more the conversations prepare, the more the people can advance together. So it's important to prayer, and the prayer is of abandoning ourselves to the Spirit. A question, interesting question here is, is it with, can there be doubts in what we're doing? Well, there can be doubts, of course. In fact, something I didn't really look at much in this presentation but there's something in spirit, in ignition spirituality and we can take a decision in this type of discernment. What we're looking is confirmation. Receive some kind of confirmation in God, by God or from God in reality. So we can take a decision and we become aware that it reason it wasn't because there's nothing that's con get confirmed that God confirms it in us. So then we know it had to change and I'll go for another uh, approach. Thank you. Somebody's asking how people can, the tools, how can we work with these tools and work with you? Well, maybe with me, but it could also be others. You'll, you'll receive the notes and the slides of this presentation. There, already you have tools there. If not, con con you can contact me and we'll continue the conversation. Yes, I just put Sister Laurence's uh, uh, co contacts in the chat. And well, you'll get the slides for the presentation and the recording will be given to you soon also in the three next three days. We have time for a few questions. Could you clarify what I, the interpretation of what I feel? Why is that important? How can this be validated? Well, it's simply asking ourselves the question. When I feel a joy or anger, why do I feel it? Of course, it can be done when we're in a moment of, a, of complete anger or complete joy. And then we need to take it back off a bit. And we can say, I, why, if I'm mad or happy, understand why that's the case. Once we have reasons, we have to find a way to say, is this true? If I doubt, that I, that I have uh, this, that I live this in other circumstances, and we can carry a certain number of, heart, of, of, of hurts. Sometimes, if we find ourselves in circumstances that uh, 
resurface those moments, we might react strongly with emotions. But once we understand that it happens because it reminds me of such situation, then you understand. So, so I shouldn't be worried about that. And it's not necessarily the because of the person uh, that I'm the, the, the person that I have in front of me. So basically, it allows me to um, validate the interpretation and to see what I may decide for the next time to do differently for the next time. Now, besides the recording or the, the slides, is there any other book that you may recommend to deepen those concepts? You'll find on internet many things around the Ignatian spirituality. The communication service is already sending uh, newsletters on a regular basis with uh, links, uh, tools, podcasts, uh, programs. There are many things that you may find on the internet, and they're already sent out, uh, shared by the communication service of uh, uh, the Jesuits. So do not hesitate to look for resources because there are many, many tools dealing with discernment, decision process um, with the nation approach. Approach, As Laurent said, you can uh, subscribe to the newsletter that we that we send out. We also uh, share information about personal and group discernment. So that's a good way to, to access the, the resources to, to subscribe to the newsletter. Somebody is asking uh, to specify the name of the Jesuits that developed the, the skill uh, of values. Bernard Lonargan is the name of the, the Jesuit. L-O-N-E-R-G-A-N, I think. And he is a Jesuit. If you look, uh, if you search scale of values, Now, the presentation of Lonergan is a little bit complex initially, but once we understand what he's talking about, then it's really helpful. Okay. And the last question, could you tell us a little bit more about difficult or challenging consolation? So often, it's a question that is often asked when we are experiencing situations that are sometimes uh, difficult, challenging. For example, challenges in a relationship or in a, with a job or work. At the beginning, we may interpret that as a, a trial or a desolation. But in the prayer, we see how God is inviting us to uh, grow up through that uh, trial or that test. And it's uh, because what we're living in that uh, difficulty is compelling us to pray more and to come back to a place of trust, of um, greater trust in God. So at the heart, of the, the difficulty or something that might be really desolating initially, at the heart, we can find a form of consolation because it will compel us to be more rooted in God, who's uh, present with us in that difficult place and rerooting ourselves in the, the trust that God is giving us to, to overcome that situation. So it can be a paradoxical type of uh, consolation, but it exists and it, it's very, it's authentic. So understanding that God is present there and that he is always inviting us to go forth, even though objectively we find ourselves in a, a situation of uh, hardship, of difficulty, of challenge. Thank you, Laurence. 
Now, unfortunately, we're getting to the, the end of uh, our uh, session together. Now, if you have more questions, you can certainly get in touch with Sister uh, Laurence. I posted the address at the end, ellubiere at jesuits.org. And we invite you to join us on February 22nd, March 1st, for a series called Climatic, Climatic uh, Crisis, how to find hope in the Trinitary um, Trinitarian view of creation. So we'll have Dr. John McCarthy, a researcher at the Laurentian University in Sudbury with us. And finally, we'd like to thank Fanny and our interpreters, Michelle and Isabel, to, uh, for ensuring a smooth event. And again, again, Laurence, thank you so much for this uh, rich presentation. Thank you. And thank you to you all for your participation and enjoy.